Good morning, folks, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone, and welcome to our energy manufacturing series. Um, our web series uh, subject today is opportunities in mass transit and electrical vehicles, and we've got a very exciting program with several speakers today. Um, I, before we get started, I just wanted to give you about a 30-second uh, preview of what the Clean Energy Manufacturing Center is. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that provides uh, technical assistance and educational services to manufacturers interested in, en in entering wind energy um, sectors, uh, including wind, solar, um, advanced transportation today, uh, and we also have a series on natural gas and geothermal markets. Um, again, we offer uh, seminars and workshops regionally in addition to our webinar series. And we also provide one-to-one -one technical assistance services uh, with the help of the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership to companies around the country. Uh, briefly, our webinar schedule is this is the fourth in a series that goes to the September. Um, schedule is up here. Um, we will be moving on, but if you want to look at this further, it, it will be on our website. Um, and now I would like to turn it over to Brian Lombardozzi, our colleague um, and our transportation expert who will take you through uh, the rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about what we're going to be getting into. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, opportunities for advanced transportation manufacturing. Um, advanced transportation offers a way to move more people and goods more efficiently and uh, provides an opportunity for our nation's manufacturers to not only serve our own growing domestic market, uh, but potentially provide them an opportunity to compete in the global marketplace as many countries across the globe are seeking solutions to their current and future transportation needs. Uh, a little bit of the work we're doing here, uh, at, I wear two hats here on um, working a lot on our transportation uh, work from a policy side and with the clean energy manufacturing sector as well. From a, with the Blue-Green Alliance, we in general are working with the administration and Congress to help to find innovative ways of expanding the market for advanced transportation in the United States, be that through intercity passenger rail, which you'll hear about today, uh, the expansion of bus, rail transit, and streetcar service, which you'll also be hearing a little bit about, and uh, working on things like the new fuel standards, which are helping drive um, advancements in uh, automotive innovations, which we'll talk a little bit about with electric vehicles. Um, we're also seeking other good uh, government policies to provide long-term certainty in the marketplace to give manufacturers the opportunity and the confidence to make the needed investments to allow them to grow their business and also to compete in the domestic and hopefully global marketplace. Um, with the Clean Energy Manufacturing uh, Center, I'm working with this domestic manufacturing uh, sector by helping educate them about these opportunities that, persist, uh, that exist in the marketplace like we're doing today, but I'm also working with offering the technical assistance to some of the public policy officials out there who are working on manufacturing issues, helping some of those people who come to us with questions actually talk to some of you out there who are manufacturers to help get the real uh, story and what's going on as, as you see it. So um, that's a little bit what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to get, introduce our first speaker today to kind of just really get into what we're talking about. Uh, we're thankfully joined today by the Federal Transit Administration Administrator uh, Peter Rogoff, who has been making great st strides to uh, create opportunities and support domestic manufacturers through uh, a great commitment to domestic manufacturing, but also he's, he's working in a, uh, in, a, in a currently constrained environment, but also been doing a lot of great in work and investments to really expand uh, public transit in the United States and to make sure that the, the goods being purchased in those expansions are made here in America by uh, working people. So uh, without further ado, Administrator Rogoff. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. Uh, this is Peter Rogoff at the FTA, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, this is, uh, as Brian pointed out, a topic that is uh, near and dear to our heart here at DOT. It is a high priority, obviously, uh, from the President uh, on down to Secretary LaHood and our Deputy Secretary John Porcari. 
uh, and we have sought to uh, set a new bar uh, in terms of our goals to make our taxpayer investments in our own infrastructure uh, benefit American companies and generate American jobs. Um, so we welcome this opportunity to apprise you as to our processes and what we've been doing and also share whatever information we can um, on how to expand those opportunities at the individual company level. Um, well, I, I also want to thank the Blue Green Alliance for sponsoring this event and, and others in this series. We appreciate everyone's hard work um, uh, putting together a transportation manufacturing action plan with our friends in the business and labor communities. I'm going to speak somewhat broadly uh, about the department's commitment to Buy America and its impact on manufacturing jobs, as well as opportunities both in the passenger rail and bus industries. And I should say, I'm going to, I'm going to be sort of wearing a couple of hats here. Some of the investments I'm going to talk about relate to intercity rail. Uh, and that is actually handled by my partner, Joe Zabo, at the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, I'll also talk about the rail and bus investments that we do uh, here at the FTA, Federal Transit Administration. Um, within uh, passenger rail, um, inner city passenger rail, we've invested in more than 44 projects, uh, which is worth more than $3 billion in 18 states, are under construction. But that's just $3 billion of $12 billion in investment that the Obama administration has uh, made in uh, the passenger rail network. Um, construction materials for these projects come from all over America, and these investments have been a major boost for American manufacturing. Uh, one very uh, beneficial program that we've used to help leverage these investments is what's called the RIF Loan Program. That's RRIF, uh, Railroad uh, Rehabilitation Infrastructure uh, Financing Loans. They're available through the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, and through those RIF loans, we've generated new manufacturing jobs in California and Ohio and Georgia. Um, last year, uh, we uh, contracted for 70 new locomotives, all U.S. made, um, for uh, service over the Northeast Corridor. There's also uh, procurements that were announced last fall for the next generation of rail equipment, uh, high-speed equipment that will be used in the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest and in California. Uh, together, those investments are worth more than $750 million. And uh, our Buy America standards will ensure that the American supply chain receives the maximum benefit um, from this new order. Uh, on the transit side here at the FTA, um, we've really sort of been leading the charge to increase manufacturing opportunities uh, through our Buy America regulations. Uh, as you may know, Buy America requires, with transit investments, that all iron, steel, and manufactured products used in federally funded projects be produced here in the United States. For rolling stock specifically, uh, more than 60% of the components by cost must be made in the U.S. with final assembly required to take place here, here in the United States. Uh, our taking on a newfound vigor in enforcing these regulations has produced very good results. I can tell you when we first came in here the year before, some uh, five years ago, uh, FTA uh, had issued as many as 37 Buy America waivers in a single year. Uh, it, it w there was a time when Buy America waivers, uh, I won't say they were routine, um, but they were much more commonplace um, under our predecessors. And it, it had gotten to the point literally where foreign manufacturers were coming and showing their wares at uh, domestic transit uh, expos and stuff and just explaining that there would be no problem in using federal funds for these investments because FTA would issue a Buy America waiver. That is very much a thing of the past. Uh, we've gone from, as an agency from issuing 37 Buy America waivers in a single year. We're now down to three, and we're not very happy about those, those three. Uh, and those three are very, in some very unique circumstances um, where there's an uh, absence of, a, of alternative availability. Uh, companies such as Siemens in Sacramento and Hubner in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, have told us that our adhering to these Buy America regulations has continually increased their U.S. manufacturing capabilities 
and the number of jobs they support. Uh, in fact, Siemens has built, uh, built up its U.S. manufacturing capabilities to include car shells, propulsion equipment, and trucks for light rail vehicle assembly. We've also received very positive feedback from companies like Filner in Alliance, Ohio, uh, Milwaukee Composites in Cudahy, Wisconsin, and NASG in Trumbersville, Pennsylvania. These are all states that were especially hard hit by the tremendous loss of good manufacturing jobs over the last several decades states that still have uh, great manufacturing capabilities, uh, trained and, um, and experienced uh, craftspeople. Um, and the good news is not only are some of these jobs coming back, but some of these companies are now exporting their products that they make for transit customers here at home, and they're exporting them around the world. Uh, Milwaukee Composites, for example, is now exporting to China, India, and the UK. Uh, when it comes to buses, um, we have we have purchased a great many buses, and I think you're going to be hearing uh, from a representative from American Seating that provides uh, the seating uh, for for many of those buses. The Recovery Act, especially, uh, provided a very large infusion of funds for our, our uh, for capital expenses for our transit systems around the country, uh, and indeed many many agencies used Recovery Act funds to purchase uh, U.S. made buses. Uh, and and uh, as a result, it has it has done very good things for the uh, the, the uh, logbook um, and the back orders for many of our domestic bus manufacturers. Um, it, Buy America has contributed to that as well, uh, both uh, for larger and smaller companies. Uh, a bus maker like New Flyer uh, has partnered with several American companies for domestic components and subcomponents to meet the 60% domestic content requirement. Uh, and to meet the Buy America final assembly requirement, New Fl Flyer has expanded its facilities in St. Cloud and Crookstown, Minnesota, creating good local jobs in the process. In fact, uh, when I was recently meeting with the senior executive team at New Flyer, uh, the, they were actually uh, having built up some of these capacities now on the U.S. side of their manufacturing base. They are now actually doing some uh, manufacturing on the U.S. side uh, for vehicles they are selling in Canada, uh, which is really the, 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 the direction we wanted to move them. Um, we recently, uh, importantly, completed a pilot program evaluating how companies comply with Buy America. Uh, we took a close look at five procurements, including a couple at New Flyer, to make sure that the vehicles that were rolling off the assembly line did, in fact, have the required percentage of domestic content that we were told they would. And I think that has had a very, very positive effect uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, it's kind of a trust but verify approach to Buy America to make sure that you know, it's one thing uh, that, that there's no daylight between what we're told the domestic content will be and what's actually delivered uh, at the end. Um, we also learned that going forward we can do a better job of explaining the rules to folks, uh, which we are also confident will lead to more domestic manufacturing opportunities. Uh, for those of you that, who might be interested in our, our Buy America rules and getting a more thorough explanation of what the rules of the road are, let me direct you to our website on this. Uh, the, uh, under Secretary LaHood's leadership, we have set up a special area of our website solely directed to our Buy America efforts. It's dot.gov slash Buy America. Um, and uh, you'll find a lot of more material on the details there. Finally, let me just conclude that uh, by reiterating that the Obama administration is really committed to the, the principle behind Buy America, which is that you, the U.S. must revive the Made in America label. Um, I was very proud uh, when the President made his joint session of Congress. I was able to sit in the gallery and hear him talk uh, specifically about the job creation opportunities, about transit investments. He happened, he happened to use the example of an investment that we were making in Houston. Uh, but this is a president that stands before joint sessions of Congress and talks about not just the benefits of the investment in infrastructure, but also the job creation and, and, and domestic manufacturing benefits that result of those investments. Uh, so you can be sure that we're going to commit, uh, we are fully committed to it, and we'll be uh, trying to uh, advance uh, these efforts even further in our second term. 
so I just want to thank you. I want to I want to thank especially the job creators on the phone who, uh, through their uh, manufacturing efforts, are reviving this industry here. We want to be your partner. We want to know how we can help further. So uh, time permitting, I hope to stay on the call and listen to the Q&A at, at the end of the call and participate if there are any questions for me. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Administrator Rogoff. We appreciate having you. Um, next up, um, to elaborate a little bit on those rail investments that um, Administrator Rogoff mentioned, uh, we're going to have uh, Kevin Brubaker, who is the Deputy Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center based out of Chicago, uh, talk a little bit about the great work that they've been doing in terms of taking a, taking a good look at what is going to be needed to build uh, inner city passenger rail and potentially high speed rail in the United States and really digging into the parts that are needed for that to identify potential manufacturers in the Midwest uh, who could be part of a high speed rail uh, supply chain. So without further ado, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Brian. Can you all hear me? Yes, I'm yes, on. Can. Okay. Um, thank you, um, and thank you, Administrator Rogoff. What I'd like to do is to drill just a little bit deeper into some of what Administrator Rogoff was saying about the Federal Railroad Administration's investments. Under the Obama administration, with support from Congress, about $10 billion is being invested right now in higher performance rail service around the country, everything from upgrades to the Northeast Corridor, expanded service in the Southeast, the Pacific Northwest, the California High Speed Rail Project, and incremental upgrades here in the Midwest, 110 mile an hour project, an hour service, excuse me. You go to the next slide, a key piece of all of this, particularly for the Midwest, is a $782 million pool of funds going into high performance rail equipment. There were a series of grants to Illinois, Michigan, California, and elsewhere, um, which were typically grants from the Federal Railroad Administration for track signals and equipment. So the equipment money, uh, the states decided to pool all together to a joint procurement. Um, this is really in two pieces, um, a $352 million uh, procurement of 130 new high-performance rail cars, and then a purchase of 35 locomotives. California led the, uh, the rail car procurement for the states an award was made uh, about last December, I think, to Nippon Shario in Rochelle, Illinois, for $352 million to manufacture these 130 rail cars for use in uh, California and the Midwest. And Illinois is going to be leading the procurement then of locomotives capable of 125 mile an hour service for use again in California, Pacific Northwest, and the, Mid and the Midwest. Um, next slide. What ELPC did was sort of was knowing this money was about to be spent, asked the question, where would it end up? Do we really have the capacity, as, as Administrator Rogoff has asserted, to make it in America? Um, we went out, talked to the 12 original equipment manufacturers that are, are based domestically, and were able to identify 460 supply chain businesses just in the industrial Midwest with the capacity to participate in these procurements. Um, remember, a train is not just a single object. It is an assembly of seats, wheels, glass, fabric, computer, cables, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the kind of things that the Midwest is already making for the autom automotive, automotive industry and elsewhere. The firms we identified range from very large places like GE Transportation, which commissioned a study demonstrating that uh, GE transportation has a bigger economic impact on the Pennsylvania economy than all the state's professional sports teams, plus oil extraction, plus gas extraction. Um, down at the other end to places like Bomar Industries in Indianapolis, a metal fabrication firm uh, literally founded in somebody's uh, barn in the back lot. Uh, and now has 40 employees working to <clears throat> manufacture uh, bicycle racks and the other things for Amtrak. Um, next slide. We mapped these firms, um, you know, showing exactly where they were. The line, the faint lines you see on this map are congressional districts, because frankly, that's what matters here. Uh, 84 firms in Illinois, 122 in Ohio. On the next slide. Um, 
73 in Wisconsin, 26 in Minnesota, 49 in, uh, in Michigan, and 99 in Indiana. I will tell you that we have not hit bottom on this. Uh, within days of releasing this report uh, in February, I was getting calls from firms we had failed to identify. Um, so this really is the tip of the iceberg. Um, in conclusion, I just, I, you know, we, the the issue of this report was uh, was designed to hit hit three major points. First, that um, for every final assembly job at a Nippon Shario or elsewhere, there are about four supply chain jobs domestically that uh, that participate in this. So, the message to to governors is, you know, it's not that Illinois won with a Nippon Shario award and Indiana lost, say. It's the Midwest one with Nippon Sharia looking for parts and supplies from <clears throat> from all over the Midwest and elsewhere. To members of Congress that even if you don't have a rail line going through your district, there's still tremendous benefits from these investments. Um, and that these you know these these investments really do extend extend beyond the final assembly plant. Um, and probably most importantly, as Administrator Rogoff said, uh, this really is an opportunity to reinvigorate domestic rail manufacturing through these these investments. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, that report definitely helps illustrate uh, some of the questions I know I hear in travel around the country when, when folks always look at uh, rail and transit sometimes as a coastal issue. It's uh, really nice to kind of remind folks about all the manufacturing jobs in the Midwest that are really tied to these areas. So even if you don't necessarily see the train tracks going through your community um, or the bus lines going through your community, there's definitely a lot of ties to um, your community through the manufacturing that's happening there. Um, speaking of manufacturing, and uh, someone who does, does quite a, a, a quite a bit of it in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, next up we have uh, Dave McLaughlin, who's the Vice President of Sales at American Seating. And uh, Dave will tell you a little bit about what they do and uh, how their work ties into the transportation supply chain. So. Take it away, Dave. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, before my brief comments, uh, I also would like to tip my hat, if I wore one, to uh, the administration's efforts to strengthen Buy America. We at American Seating don't don't talk a lot about about Buy America. We talk a lot about Made in America, although both are very important to our business. Uh, we are a U.S.-based manufacturer of seating and safety systems, uh, and I'm going to come back to safety systems uh, in a couple of minutes. Most of our manufacturing is done in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we've been headquartered there for, uh, we, we are in our 127th year now. Uh, we do have uh, some light manufacturing in Grand Forks, North Dakota, primarily to serve the needs of uh, a couple of our larger customers. And we're not uh, bashful about getting getting close to our customers, and, and as I will describe shortly, our suppliers aren't bashful about getting close to us. We are a small business, and our DNA, DNA has always been and will remain uh, a commitment to an extremely high U.S. content. Um, how high? 75% of our supply chain spend, that's goods and services that go into our products, come from three states, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. And if you add Wisconsin and Illinois to it, the percentage moves to about 82%. The result of that uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 content is that our products across our company uh, will have uh, all of the final assembly is done domestically, and the U.S. content number ranges from 70 to 98 percent. We're really talking about transportation investment today, and if we look specifically at our transportation-related products, uh, we're very proud to be in the 85 to 98 percent range. The natural result of having such a high concentration of Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers um, is all good news for us. It results in consistent lead time uh, from from our suppliers. We're, we're not faced with heavy water time or such. Uh, we have much, much better communications with our suppliers. We have a great deal of respect in, in, uh, for our suppliers. 
And having them as close as they are, if we have an issue, if we have an idea, if we have something that we want to talk to them about, we don't have to do it via email or web conferencing. We can hop in a car and within three or four hours we're, we, we're talking to the people that we want to talk to. Quality is much more consistent and much, much higher uh, across the board, uh, primarily because our suppliers know what we expect and we communicate that expectation quite frequently. We obviously um, have a better footprint in our community. And when I say community, I'm talking about our region. For every 100 sets of seats, and a set of seats is, our, in our definition, the seats that go in a, to a bus or a rail car, we create between two and four full-time equivalent jobs and that produces, based on our work with our Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers, as well as economic development input, between 8 and 12 additional jobs. So it, it's, uh, it's very important to us to walk the walk and talk the talk, if you will, about uh, Buy America and Made in America. We always, uh, just like every a lot of other companies, we have dabbled in our past with outsourcing of assembly, outsourcing of supply, basically driven by, by lower costs. But at the end of the day, we think um, we are building a high-quality product at very competitive prices by keeping our supply chain closer to home. The other benefit that we have derived from concentrating on our supply chain so close to our home is a phenomena that uh, um, that I suspect other suppliers experience from time to time. I talked a few minutes ago about the respect that we have our, for our suppliers uh, in long-term respect. That goes bi-directionally. Over the last three years, we've actually had opportunities be presented to us by our supply chain They've had ideas that they think we could uh, run with uh, from a sales and marketing standpoint and from a design uh, and manufacturing standpoint. We've actually partnered with a couple of our primary long-term suppliers because they believe that we could do a better job with their ideas. And also they didn't want to get into a competitive situation uh, with us. So it's, it's been an unexpected benefit that, uh, that I expect to, to continue. So a long and short of this um, discussion on American manufacturing is the, the brutal reality is our, most of our customers are primarily located in North America. The funding for the products that we build ultimately come from public sources and therefore, our business model has been and will continue to be uh, local supply chain, local sourcing, whatever possible. We're very proud of that. We believe that our employees, our customers, and our broader community deserve to have us create jobs at home and not outsource them. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dave. We, we're glad to get your perspective on this. Um, Coming up next, uh, we've talked a little bit about the opportunities on the rail side of things, uh, the bus and transit side of things, but for a, a lot of folks out there, their their day-to-day -day form of transportation is the automobile. And in terms of advanced transportation, when we're talking about advancement in um, automobiles, we're talking about ways of either using less uh, fossil fuels to power that or just go fully electric. So today, we have uh, David Howell, who's the team leader for hybrid and electric vehicles in the Department of Energy, who is uh, going to give us a nice little presentation explaining a little bit about, you know, what really goes into uh, these vehicles and what has sort of been going on in his world that might be of interest to you all on the phone. So, uh, David, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, I'm Dave Howell. I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy. I work in the Vehicle Technologies Office in the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy uh, area. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, actually focus on our battery R&D work and particularly on the ma a manufacturing update on advanced batteries for electric vehicles. 
Um, next slide. So just to give you a, uh, an idea of why this area is important to the nation, uh, you see it here on this chart. Our U.S. oil consumption uh, in 2012 was 17.1 million barrels per day. Uh, that's down from 2010, but still that's very significant. If you actually break that out in terms of sectors, the transportation sector uh, consumed 72% of that oil. And uh, further breaking that down, you see that on-road vehicles are responsible for 80% of the transportation oil use. So increasing the efficiency of the automobile and heavy-duty vehicles on-road uh, traffic is very important, not only to our energy security, national security, economic security, and environmental security. Uh, next slide. Um, we do have a, a, uh, a blossoming uh, hybrid electric drive vehicle industry uh, coming up here in the United States. As you see, the total auto sales for 2012 was 14.5 million. Uh, over the last 15 years, we've had a pretty steady um, sales of a hybrid electric vehicles. And in 2010, we saw the market entry of plug-in and electric vehicles, and you see steady growth in both of those sectors. Uh, next slide. So why is battery innovation and manufacturing important to the United States? Uh, not only do you see uh, the sales of these types of vehicles being more and more a proportion of the total sales in, 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 the, in the U.S. and in the world, but the U.S. hybrid electric vehicle market is actually the largest in the world, and that's for 12 years running. Uh, and then if you take a look at the U.S. plug-in electric vehicle market, penetrations over the last several years is three times higher than in Europe and ten times higher than in China. We think these trends will continue over, over the course of the next ten years. Secondly, you see new CAFE standards uh, have, been, uh, have been adopted for the years 2017 to 2025. Those standards include targeted incentives to encourage early adoption of advanced uh, uh, vehicles such as hybrid electric drive vehicles. Uh, the, these standards require model year 2025 OEM car and light duty fleets to achieve a fuel economy of uh, 54.5 miles per gallon that doubles the current standard. And it also includes an emission standard of 70 grams per, per uh, 70 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer. That's very difficult to achieve without electrification of the vehicle. Uh, you see many market projections for these types of vehicles. Uh, I've picked one here, the Pike Research projection. They project that in, two, in 2020 that uh, around 400,000 plug-in vehicles would be sold in the United States. Uh, HEV sales will continue to rise. Uh, the worldwide market of advanced electric drive vehicle batteries would be about $20 billion. And in the North American share of that, about 22%, assuming that many of these large batteries will be manufactured in the country where the cars are sold. So uh, the North American share actually may be higher than that since we actually buy most of these vehicles today. So batteries are a high-value component of all HEVs and PEVs, and advances in battery technology and manufacturing are crucial, uh, crucial for the market success of these vehicles. Next slide. You see three, uh, three uh, types of vehicles uh, that are in the class I'm talking about for plug-in vehicles. Uh, the Chevy Volt, the Nissan Leaf, and the Tesla, all three of these are on the market today. The Chevy Volt is a plug-in <coughs> hybrid vehicle. Uh, it gives you about 40 miles of electric range. The Nissan Leaf is a, as an all-electric vehicle, provides 75 miles of electric range. <coughs> Excuse me. And, of course, the Tesla is an all-electric vehicle that provides 265 miles of all-electric range. The thing the point that, uh, <clears throat> that you see on this slide is the battery cost is very high. It's a single component of the car. So significant advances in battery affordability and performance are needed to achieve our electric vehicle goals uh, that's <clears throat> that uh, we've developed for the electric vehicle EV Everywhere Grand Challenge. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is the EV Everywhere Grand Challenge? Uh, it's a presidential challenge. President Obama announced it in, um, in 2012. 
and, to, and the challenge is, is to enable the U.S. to be the first in the world to produce a plug-in electric vehicle that's as affordable as today's gasoline-powered vehicles within the next 10 years. It includes more than technology development. Technology push is one of the key, the key areas, though. Uh, the targets focus mostly on reducing the battery cost, reducing the electric drive system's cost, uh, 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 developing lightweight structures, and enabling technologies such as advanced climate control. But there's, a, there's also two other major components. One is to develop the necessary charging infrastructure that would be that would enable the adoption of these vehicles, and actually to develop consumer acceptance and market pull for these vehicles. Next slide. <coughs> so, if you actually look at the uh, cost of batteries in in these types of vehicles, what you see is there's uh, three major areas of cost. The pack cost or the assembly that you see uh, in the vehicle, the electrode and cell uh, that are inside the pack, and of course the materials that are inside the cell. Uh, our cost analysis shows that uh, for the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that the cost breaks out pretty much evenly across these three areas. But for an electric vehicle that gives you 300 miles range, you see that the, the active materials costs are the major cost component. Uh, we go ahead and click. So here's some materials uh, breakthroughs that are needed. Uh, next. So in increasing the material capacities reduces cell material requirements and the amount of the electrode needed per cell. So uh, we are not only developing but trying to develop manufacturing technologies that would enable high capacity cathodes, high voltage electrolytes, and metal or alloy anodes. Um, uh, of course, along with that, uh, you can develop the materials that go into the cell, but you also need to manufacture those material, materials at a, at a uh, competitive cost. And then uh, all of these things would reduce the cost of uh, the entire battery pack. Next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, second er major area of uh, importance to us in focus is to develop uh, advances in the and the electrode production and cell assembly process. Here you see the major elements of that process uh, to develop the electrode, which would be mixing, coating, drying, and pressing, and sling. That takes about 47% of the cost of the entire electrode and cell assembly. Another area is the assembly itself and electrolyte filling and the formation and sorting of the cell once it has been uh, assembled. Uh, uh, next uh, click. So we're developing things such as substitutes for the solvents that are used in electrode uh, processing, uh, dry processing techniques, pasture and binders, high-speed deposition, you can, as you see here, next slide. And uh, for the formation, there's areas that we focus on to uh, decrease the time that it takes in order to form the cell. Forming cells sort of like is basically breaking the cell in, ensuring its uh, quality and its safety. Typically takes three to five week process uh, to do this. Uh, we're trying to develop techniques to significantly shorten the time to break the cell in before it's shipped. Next slide. And the final area of battery pack assembly, there's manufacturing opportunities, uh, just you know, simply in the thermal management systems, things that could uh, things that would support the development of this industry, uh, the manufacture of advanced compressors, evaporators, blowers, thermal plates and insulators, uh, manufacture of electronic control modules and sensors for the battery management system, and of course, manufacture of the purchased items of the cell, such as the cell terminals, bus bars, and, and modules and jackets. Next slide. <coughs> I did want to touch uh, a little on the Recovery Act Battery Manufacturing uh, Initiative. Uh, this was the 2009 Recovery Act. It provided $1.5 billion to establish battery manufacturing capability in the United States. That $1.5 billion was actually matched by the industry. Uh, the Department of Energy awarded 20 contracts um, from uh, uh, materials, manufacturing, and production to sell 
um, uh, electrode and, and cell production to battery assembly. Uh, we have quite a few contracts that are completed. A uh, few are still ongoing. Uh, to date, we have uh, established an electrode throughput of 5.4 million kilowatt hours per year. That's a capability that's assuming full production capability at the, at the plants that are, that are up and running. That uh, translates to a cell assembly capability of about 250,000 10 kilowatt hour PHEV packs per year. <coughs> And a cell and a battery pack assembly capability of over 100,000 packs per year. Next slide. <coughs> I mentioned the materials production area, which is extremely important in terms to in terms of supporting the manufacturing of of these batteries. Uh, here you see 10 contracts, uh, by, uh, from cathode production to to uh, electrolyte production, anode and separator, cell hardware. Uh, most of these facilities have uh, are, are completed or, or have um, lines that are up and running and uh, shipping material today. Um, we see this as the, the uh, first investments of a uh, uh, manufacturing capability in the United States for these advanced batteries. Uh, in 2009, basically, there were no facilities of this type in the United States, and today we, we will have uh, about a little over 20 facilities, and, and by the time we're finished, over 30 bat advanced battery facilities in the United States, including materials production. But we do see that there's more that needs to, to happen in this area in order to continue to grow this market. Next slide. And that completes this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to thank all our presenters. And uh, at this time, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Linda so she can run through uh, how the question and answer section uh, works. Sure. And as I am unmuting the speakers, everybody who's participating, if you do have any questions, you should be able to see kind of a toolbar at the top of your screen that will drop down. Um, and allow you to push the chat button and then just type in your question there. Um, let me see. I think I'm just missing Kevin. Here we go. So um, any questions yet from the audience and the participants? Actually, I could kick it off myself as Brian. Um, yep. If you don't mind. Just a, a question to, to Kevin. Um, so with the Midwest uh, study that you guys did, could you just clarify whether or not th those are um, potential suppliers, actual suppliers, and um, you know a little bit about some of the folks that you're, you're finding there for like um, just if they're aware of this already, or if there needs to be some further education uh, for some of these suppliers to understand the opportunities that exist. The the answer is really all of the above, Brian. Um, these are firms that are not yet, most of these are not yet participating. These are, after all, the contract was awarded to Nipponchario just a few months ago, uh, right about the time we were completing our study. These are all firms that, uh, you know, are, are in the industry, but um, may not know about this opportunity. Some of them are, are active, others aren't. But yeah, there's plenty of opportunity to be educating these firms. Thank you. Okay. A um, uh, couple of others here. What are the opportunities for end of life cycle related to the batteries? How will they be disposed of? Is there value that remains in a spent battery? Uh, good question. Um, we are doing studies on uh, not only life cycle analysis of batteries, but, uh, which includes recycling and reuse of the batteries. Uh, much of the, that work is being conducted by uh, collaboration between the University of California at Davis and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We do see that there could be a second use of, uh, particularly of the larger electric vehicle batteries in, uh, in uh, home, uh, like a stationary power applications, particularly um, uh, applications such as uh, um, backup power for homes and businesses, um, and, and of course uh, we do see that there's residual value in the battery materials themselves once they need to be recycled. 
and so we are developing processes to reclaim as much of the material as, as we possibly can, not only the aluminum and copper and the, and the nickel or cobalt, but also the lithium mm -hmm. and uh, potentially even recovering um, the solvents uh, in, the, uh, in the electrolyte. So there are certainly um, opportunities there to continue to develop techniques to, uh, to uh, recover these materials and then actually reuse them in, in the life cycle. Sure. Um, a question for Mr. Roboff. Are there projections for domestic content target percentages for upcoming FTA procurements? Will 60% persist? Uh, well, it, it will at least for a while in the following way, um, uh, and that is that 60% is, is the law of the land. Um, and uh, the administration actually proposed, uh, um, and I have testified before the Congress about a proposal to raise it by 10% a year over multiple years to sort of ease the industry up to 100%. Um, uh, for rolling stock. Unfortunately, uh, Congress did not take up that proposal in the MAP-21 law, um, and uh, so we are obviously open to a higher percentage. We do believe that in order to not have a uh, huge um, discord uh, within the ongoing um, supply chain mechanisms, one would have to phase in an increase in the percentage, but right now 60% uh, is the law of the land and will be at least for another couple of years. Okay, thanks. Um, for the Department of Energy, what are the technologies that the DOE is investing in? It appears that the lithium ion is largely the focus, but what about nickel metal hybrid or others? Sure. Um, we do focus a lot on lithium ion batteries, but you've got to recognize that lithium ion batteries are a family of chemistries. You can have cathodes and lithium ion that are based on nickel or, or cobalt or manganese or iron phosphate or a combination of those types of materials. You also can have anodes in the battery that's not only uh, combinations of graphite and carbon but uh, metal alloy. There's a lot of room left to develop uh, and advance lithium ion. Other chemistries that we're looking at are the, are the lithium metal type chemistries, uh, uh, lithium metal polymer or lithium sulfur. We also do some work at the Department of Energy on lithium air and metal air batteries. Um, some of these batteries lend themselves more toward stationary application at this point than the high power needs of, of a vehicle environment. Um, we, have, we, put, we have developed uh, in the past um, uh, the nickel metal hydride technology for vehicle applications. If there's innovations in that technology that could enable us to go further with it, we'd certainly be interested in those innovations. And we actually do some, continue to do some work in advanced lead acid batteries for microhybrid type applications. Great. Um, is there growth within the electric vehicle market expected to be tempered as a result of other new vehicle technologies, such as natural gas-powered vehicles, which are becoming more and more abundant around the Midwest? Well, that's, that, is, that's, that is possible that uh, you know, the, the electric vehicle, you know, uh, is, is a fairly broad uh, set of architectures. Um, you could look at a micro-hybrid type of architecture, which is sort of start-stop application, or the conventional hybrid uh, uh, electric vehicle. All of these need advanced batteries, and they would be applicable to natural gas vehicles, and including the plug-in hybrid uh, with a short elect uh, electric uh, uh, range. Uh, but, you know, all of these vehicles, the natural gas vehicle, the battery electric, the fuel cell, have to compete with advances in the combustion engine, uh, internal combustion engine area. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a horse race. Uh, we see that the, uh, the different pathways are actually um, of achieving petroleum reduction are actually encouraging, not discouraging. But, uh, you know, in the end, market will determine, you know, the, the market penetration of any one of these vehicles. 
Sure. A, lo a lot of questions around the batteries. Um, so what's the future of the hydrogen fuel cell for power cars, buses, locomotives? Well, you know, um, there's been uh, quite a bit of advances over the last uh, 10 years in the fuel cell area. And we do see that there are several company, uh, companies that are actually announced that they're going to put fuel cell vehicles in the market around the 2015, 2016 area. You know, there's still work to be done to continue to improve the performance of the fuel cell, of the uh, hydrogen storage, and even the hydrogen delivery systems. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, we've come a long way. We, we see these starting to be competitive, um, maybe more in the uh, midterm than, than the near term. Other um, areas for hydrogen fuel cells are in different sectors, uh, and you mentioned several of them. Uh, one of those areas would be for heavy vehicle uh, anti-idling and load reduction uh, uh, for long-haul trucks, uh, sort of a, a auxiliary power unit type application. So we, we do see that there's some uh, uh, um, progress area that looks like that fuel cell vehicles will continue to be something that we want to continue to pursue for the transportation sector. Sure, great. A um, little switch of gears. Are there, Kevin, kind of related to your study with the potential passenger rail supply chain, are there similar studies for like other regions, the Mid-Atlantic region or maybe Pacific Northwest? There are not, nobody has yet uh, done comparable studies for, for other regions. There was a, um, a much larger national study, um, which perhaps Brian can speak of, looking at component parts. Um, but this is the first of this kind. I should mention though, that we've done comparable studies in the Midwest for wind and solar supply chains leading, sim leading to similar kinds of results. And this is Brian. To speak of the study that Kevin was talking about, um, so the uh, Duke University's uh, put out a, a rail study that is actually available on the Blue Green Alliance's website. So if you go to Blue Green Alliance slash programs slash Apollo, uh, slash TMAP, you can access, uh, there's a link to the Duke University study which goes through and identifies the capacity in the U.S. for uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 uh, uh, manufacturing for uh, passenger rail in the United States. I believe there's also some information on buses in that study as well. Um, essentially that is the original equipment manufacturers and the large component parts. It does not get to the level of detail that uh, Kevin's study does in the Midwest about uh, smaller item stuff. Sure. Um, say for, so for the panelists, um, can you envision a U.S. market down the road where different technologies become localized within different U.S. geographical regions, i.e. electric vehicles maybe out west or natural gas in the east? This is Dave Howell. Um, I could see it, it, I could see that happening in terms of the uh, majority sales of a particular vehicle to to be more regional than than local. Um, as as was mentioned, uh, not only the hybrid vehicle or micro hybrid, but even the plug-in hybrid lends itself to you know short commuting dis distances and urban driving on all electric range. Um, you have the short-range electric vehicle that, that lends itself more to commuter and uh, inner-city driving. And, of course, the long-range EV, we still got a long way to go on the battery for that to really drive the cost down. But, you know, that would be more of a replacement for your internal combustion engine type vehicle. So I could see that there's, you know, different regions would, uh, would uh, be more conducive to a certain type of vehicle. And, and I would add then, just from the from the manufacturing side, yes, manufacturing tends to cluster. You know, Silicon Valley is is a a manufacturing cluster of sorts. Uh, the auto supply industry in the Midwest is one. So over time, I think one would expect to see similar kinds of industrial clustering around different kinds of vehicle technology. Uh, this is Peter Rogoff. Uh, frankly, in 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 bus supplying. Uh, in the bus industry, uh, we already see it uh, in that 
there's a higher propensity for transit agencies, for example, to be buying natural gas buses in areas that already have uh, plentiful suppl uh, local supplies of natural gas. I think it's also a way, since all of these agencies need to go to the public for their money, whether it's state legislature or a city or county council, that they can uh, advertise that their technology choice for their vehicle promoted a local industry. Uh, especially when it comes to natural gas. Now, I will say, longer term, I hope we don't have a clustering, at least in the transit space, we don't have clustering, obviously, because the economies of scale, um, you know, uh, and it would be, it would be, uh, I think, preferential for uh, there to there to be, you know, so the maximum opportunities, uh, you know, it is sometimes asserted that uh, the newest technologies won't come into the United States because unlike Europe or Asia, uh, our transit market is not big enough to entice uh, uh, new entrants. Um, and that's why I want to make sure that, you know, when we're trying to promote a new uh, technology or bring in a new manufacturer for uh, domestic manufacturing, that they have the benefit of the entire U.S. transit industry as a potential um, uh, consumer base, uh, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how all this emerges. Sure. Um, another question probably for you, Peter. Um, how can state-of-the-art rail car components gain approval for high-speed rail service in terms of the current FRA, AARA standards? Um, I think it was, uh, you probably meant FRA, AAR standards, uh, the Association of American Railroads. Um, I, you know, I'm not the best expert in answering that and because I don't know precisely what their approval process is. I do know, and I'd encourage you to interface with the FRA on that question. I do know this, um, and this was the whole motivation behind um, the uh, joint procurement um, that was highlighted uh, for rail, both in California and the Midwest, and that is they do want to use this as an opportunity to not just advance the state of the art on vehicles, but also advance the current uh, state as it relates to um, domestic manufacturing. Um, so I would uh, encourage you uh, to uh, take that question to the FRA, and if you have uh, trouble getting an answer, to, to bring it back to me, and I'll make sure you get one. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, I think that concludes our questions. I did want to let everybody know we did record this and we do have the, um, we'll put a PDF of the presentations available on the, on our website, www.thecemc.com. Look under the latest news section and there should be a piece about the webinar today. So that should be up by the end of the day Friday. Um, next month, Again, the fourth Wednesday, we will be talking about the natural gas industry. I do want to thank everybody, David and David and Kevin and Peter. Thank you so much for your participation today. Thank you, Brian, for introducing us and keeping the flow going. Thank you. Have a Thanks. wonderful one. Bye, everybody.